Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, I know we had a few technical difficulties this morning. I'm sorry about that. That was my fault. Um, also, our live stream is currently not working, so those who are viewing later will uh, be able to see it as we post it. Um, but uh, just several things going on. We have gremlins in our, in our system this morning. But uh, we're very grateful to be here um, in person, to be able to see everybody, and it's always good to, to be here. I appreciate Joe's uh, remarks on, on the book of Mark. Um, it's one of those things that took me a while to really uh, grasp and understand were uh, primarily the reason we have these four Gospels. And it's interesting because we assume that they're going to be identical, and they're not identical. And uh, the reason they're not identical is because God is showing us the life of God. He's showing us the life of Jesus and the gospel message in, in a multifaceted form, like a, like a diamond. It's so complex, the plan of God, that we see it in so many different angles. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about this morning is the idea that Matthew, when he is presenting his gospel, that Matthew is presenting it in such a way to make a point. He's not giving us all the details, he's not giving us all the information, but he's giving us what he wants us to see because that is the point he's trying to make. And so it's important for us to understand that. People have a hard time understanding why they're different, but there's a reason for their differences. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to begin our new sermon series, and we're going to start talking about this concept as we move into the Sermon of the Mount and start talking about Jesus' teachings about the Torah, the old law, and how it needs to be understood a little differently than the Jews understood it. And we'll talk about that later. But this morning we're going to begin a sermon series that we're going to call Follow, where we're just going to talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus, to get up and to follow Jesus. And so what I want to do is I want to begin with a question. I want you to think about this, and I want you to kind of put yourself in this place where you were when you first heard about or first learned about a man by the name of Jesus? Where were you? What do you remember about that time? And I think for a lot of us, we have always kind of known, especially if we've grown up in America and grown up going to, to church, and we, we know and have known that there has been this man by the name of Jesus. Um, I remember as a kid coloring the little pictures. You remember those? You know, we color the pictures. I, we even made a, a, a little uh, manger out of uh, construction paper with some cotton in it, you know, with little baby Jesus in there. And, and so I, for me, I don't know if I can ever remember a time that I don't, I, I didn't know about a man, person, by the name of Jesus. That has always been part of my life. Others in the world have not been so fortunate. They, they did not know about Jesus, and they learn about him later in life. But as for many of us, it's that name has been so familiar to us that we've always seemed to, to know. But maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're the kind of person that learned later in life. So I want you to think about where were you when you first heard about Jesus, when you first learned about, learned about a man named Jesus. But when was it, now this is another question, kind of a follow-up question, when was it when you truly learned about Jesus? See, there's a big difference, isn't there? There's a difference in knowing that there's a man named Jesus and learning about Jesus. Who is he? What did he do? What accomplishments are in his life? The nature of Jesus, right? I mean, who is he? And so that, that's different, isn't it? When we really begin to learn and grasp and understand who Jesus really is. So think about that. Where were you? When was it when you began to truly know about Jesus and learn about him? And... and at that point, you had to make a decision in your life, right? You had to decide, what am I going to do with this information? What am I going to do with my knowledge of Jesus? What am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with him now that I know about him? And, and really, for me, I, I, I remember kind of going through that process. I think we all have gone through that process. And I remember when that knowledge of Jesus turned into me following Jesus. Now, that's a different aspect, isn't it? Right? To hear about a man named Jesus, to learn about a man named Jesus, but then to follow that man named Jesus. Now, that's different. 
And so I remember when I began that process and began to think through in my mind what I needed to do and what sacrifices I needed to make and what changes needed to be made so that I could truly follow Jesus. Now here's our main question, okay? That was our thought-provoking question. This is our main one. This is the one we're really going to focus on this morning. And I want you to think about this. What changed? What changed in your life when you decided to follow Jesus? Just think about that for a minute. What, what changes took place in your life when you decided to follow Jesus? When you decided to get up and to follow Him? Maybe, maybe it was a career change. Maybe whatever you were doing before kept you from truly following Jesus and you thought, you know, I really can't devote myself to the life that I'm being called to while doing what I'm doing. And, and that might not be the case for everybody, but maybe that was the case for you. Maybe something in your life, a career, and you had to let that go in order to devote yourself to Jesus. Or maybe it was a friendship. Maybe, maybe you had some relationships in your life and friendships in your life and you knew that the way you were going was not the way that you have always gone and those who are with you are going the wrong way and, and you need to make some, some choices about some friends or, or people in your life that are keeping you from truly devoting yourself and being on the path that Jesus has you on, that he's calling you to. And maybe that's the case. Maybe you had to let go of friendships in order to truly follow Jesus. Or maybe it was habits, right? I mean, we've all had habits and we've all done things and, and, and you know, some things we're just not really very proud of, but we've done things and maybe we had to let go of some of those things. Some of those habits, some of those things that we used to do, that we used to value. Maybe we found pleasure in those things, or they made us complete. And now, in light of the knowledge of Jesus, those things become dim and less important to us. And we had to let them go in order to devote ourselves to what Jesus is calling us to do. It, there's one fact, I think. You know, all of our situations are going to be different. All of our life experiences are going to be different. All of our, our, the things that we let go and we laid aside are going to be different. But there's one thing that remains the same for everybody who has made that decision. And that is that Jesus changes your life. That because of Jesus, your life has changed. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Because of Jesus, your life has changed. And we can all hold that as something that's in common even though our sacrifices may be a little different. We know that we have all had life-changing experiences because of Jesus. My life changed because of Jesus. I, I, I thought differently. I, I made different decisions. I, I talked differently. I mean, there's so many things in my life that I can think about that changed in light of the knowledge of Jesus that I've made those changes. And I'm sure your life has changed as well. So this is going to be our topic as we move through this sermon series this month, is as we talk about following Him and, and leaving everything behind and, and just really getting up and, and going and doing what Jesus calls us to do. And so these are thoughts that I want us to think about as we move through this lesson series. So let's put a definition on what it means to be a true follower, a disciple, right? That's the word that we use. What, is, what do true disciples look like? What do they look like? And so let's, let's talk about this for a minute. These are a group of people, if we're talking about disciples as a whole, true disciples are a group of people that have a common doctrine, a common ethic, a common goal, a common love, and a common relationship to God, Jesus, and the Spirit. So this is the definition. Now we can fill in all those blanks, and we will, but the idea is this is the basic idea, right? We, we share in common teachings, don't we? We share in this understanding. Where do we get that teaching from? We get it from God, don't we? We get it from Jesus. We, we share in that. We share in a common ethic. We, we, we share this ideology that is so different often than the world, and we got it from Jesus, right? And, and we share in a common love, and guess who taught us that love? And we share in a common relationship, and, and guess through whom we receive that relationship? See, that's the point, isn't it? When we follow and we're true disciples, we need to have these things in common. These are important. So, 
that is what I think, <laughs> as I'm reading through the book of Matthew and, and talking about the different things that Matthew has been talking about and emphasizing the different things that Matthew emphasizes, this seems to be what Matthew is focusing on. That he is trying to draw, specifically the Jews, right? He's trying to convince the Jews that this Jesus is the Messiah. Isn't that right? That he is God with us. That he is Emmanuel. And that if they are going to follow him, that there are things that they're going to have to change, right? Isn't that what John the baptizer said to the Jews as they are being called to repent, right? And be baptized, that idea of passing through the water and moving into this ideal of, of repentance, a life of change, it, based on the knowledge that Jesus is coming. Remember, that was John's message, because Jesus had not yet revealed himself, and so John is preparing the way. He's making the way ready for the coming of the king. And so that's the idea that John lays out for us. But John, Matthew, rather, wants us to focus on the facts, the facts that the Jews had to wrestle with, that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, this man, they knew him. They, they walked with him. They probably worked with him. They knew Jesus. You know, he wasn't a stranger to them. But they had to come to grips that this man, who they knew, was indeed the Son of God, that He was Messiah, the Anointed One of God, that He was Emmanuel, God with us, that He is the long-awaited King of Israel that has been born into the world, born of a woman, born under the law, born into the world to save the world, to rescue us, to bring us out of darkness into light, to, to be the Son of God, that Israel was not. Remember, that was actually a phrase that was used for the people of Israel, that they were God's son. Now, there are other analogies and illustrations that are used to depict the relationship between God and Israel. But in, in many cases, the son of God was, was a way that the prophets spoke of Israel as a whole. And yet, this man, singular, is referred to as the Son of God. He is the embodiment of all of what the prophets spoke. And where Israel failed, Jesus will succeed. Where Israel fell short, Jesus will be successful. Where, where they succumbed to all of the temptations of the world, where they gave in to the desires to be like other nations, Jesus will fully and completely give everything to the work of the Father and follow His Father to the very end, right? Even if that means death, death on a cross, Jesus would be successful. And if you remember from our study of the temptations of Jesus, we talked about how Deuteronomy is a, is a major text for understanding the first parts of Matthew, that in the text, Matthew is going to, uh, we might use the term riff off of, you know, kind of a modern term, but the idea of riffing off of another text or drawing from information that's already pre-existing, I like to call them hyperlinks. When you read through Matthew, you should immediately start thinking, oh, I remember that from Deuteronomy, and, and be drawn to the text, because that's where Matthew is getting a lot of his ideas. That's how he's building this narrative. And so quotations and themes are directly linked to these uh, series of sermons that Moses preached, because that's what they were, weren't they? When, when the people come out of captivity and they wander in the wilderness and they're going to go into the new promised land, Moses takes the time to preach a series of sermons that are going to remind Israel of who they are, who they belong to, and what they're supposed to do and who they're supposed to be when they enter into the promised land. They needed to be reminded of that. And that's what Deuteronomy is, a series of these sermons that, that are preached. So look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 6 and 8. Moses commissions the people of Israel. He commissions them and he says, See, I have taught you, Moses says to them, statutes and judgments. Just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. In verse 6, So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this is a great nation 
a great nation is wise and understanding. And so the idea is that there are people out there that they're, they're going to go into this land. There's going to be other people around, other nations around. And they're going to see this group of people. They're going to enter into the land. And they're going to look at the law. And they're going to be amazed at it. You know, sometimes we think of law as just being a, a heavy-handed, difficult thing, impossible to keep. But for God, it was wisdom. It was knowledge. It was, it was saying to these people that I'm going to give you a law, a way to live, a lifestyle that you're going to live. And if you keep it, you will be blessed. Right? Not, not just supernaturally by God, even though that's true, but this type of lifestyle as a people group is going to be a blessing to them. And other nations are going to look in and they're going to see their law and they're going to think, wow, these people are amazing. Where do they get this law from? You know, I mean, where do these people come from? And they'll say, our God gave it to us. Our God gave us this law. This wisdom is not ours, it's God's wisdom. And, the, and people are going to be amazed at the things they do and the things they say. What a wise and understanding people these will be because God's law is with them. Verse 7, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on him? See, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that there were many great nations, right? There were lots of great nations, big nations, and they got there by force. They got there by war. They got there by power. They got there by prestige and, and other probably not so good means. But they got there and they were great nations and they were big nations, but no nation, no matter how big or how powerful or how great, was as great as God's nation, as Israel, because God was near to them. They could call upon him. They could speak to their God. Their God would be with them and communicate with them. And that was special, wasn't it? It was unique. It, it set Israel apart from every other nation. Their God was with them. And you know, they weren't a great nation because they were stronger. They weren't a great nation because they were smarter. I mean, they really weren't. I mean, they were very disobedient and often made really awful decisions. I mean, Israel was not the smartest of all the people, but the idea is that God had pulled them out of darkness and brought them into His presence, and He is with them, and that's what makes them great. That's what makes them powerful. In verse 8, Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? See, these people, right, had left everything behind in Israel, or Egypt, rather, now, now, you may think, okay, well, yeah, they left everything behind. They didn't have a really great life, and that's true. They were in captivity. But if you remember, as they're going through the wilderness, what do they desire more than anything else? What do they grumble about? What do they think about? They think about the new land they're going into. Do they think about the promises that God has made to them? Or do they think about going back to Egypt? <laughs> Right? Let's just go back, right? I mean, this, this Moses has led us out into the wilderness to, to die. We want to go back. We want to go back into captivity because at least we had houses, right? At least we had food. At least we had a place to go. Now, we were slaves and most of us wouldn't survive over 40, but you know, that's okay because Egypt was so great and Pharaoh was so wonderful to us that we want to go back. It sounds kind of crazy, but that's what they did. They wanted to go back. But they did leave it all behind at some point in their life. And they did decide to follow after Moses as he leads them through the Red Sea. To hear and obey, to keep God's covenant, to be a possession of God, to belong to him, to have a common doctrine, right? They had a common teaching, common ethics, common goal, common love, had a common relationship with God. They had these things in common. Now Matthew, <clears throat> excuse me, Matthew ends his gospel very interestingly because it gives us an idea of where Matthew's going, doesn't it? When we get to the end, we realize this whole time Matthew has been building disciples. He has been creating disciples for Jesus and calling people to a radical discipleship. And so when we get to the very end of the book of Matthew, we have what we commonly call the, the Great Commission, right? In Matthew chapter 28, and then he says in verse 19, Matthew says, go. He's telling his apostles who had followed him, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, 
right? So it's not going to be limited to Israel anymore, is it? It's suddenly going to be a broader perspective. All the nations go to all the world, make disciples for Jesus. That was their work, to go and to call people through the gospel of Jesus Christ to join them in following the Messiah, a new way of living. It's like Moses, isn't it? The story really has a lot of similarities because it's basically the same story. It's the idea that, that these people are being called out of this slavery, a world of darkness, into a better way of living, a better life, freedom. And, and they're given this way of living, this ethic, this law, this doctrine, so that they can be separate and apart. Now, it doesn't always make sense, does it? When we think about the things that the Bible teaches us that we ought to do and we ought to say and the things how we are supposed to worship, and we think, well, can't I just do whatever I want to do? Right? I mean, can't I just kind of live in the world and, then, you know, kind of do the Jesus thing on the side? Can't I just be worldly? Can't I just continue the life I've always lived? Can't I just love the things I've always loved, desire the things I've always desired, think the way I've always thought, and then be a Jesus follower on the side? Matthew would say, no, no, you can't. In fact, you have to let that all go and adopt a new way of thinking, a new way of loving, a new ethic, a new way of being human. And that's what we're being called to do. And Matthew is telling his disciples, his apostles, to go out and make people like that. Make disciples of all the nations. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Making people who become the possession of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Now, the phrase here in Greek is eis to unama. Now, if Benny were here, he would correct me on that, of course. But uh, that's the basic gist of the idea of that phrase. And it means to become the possession of. And so the idea of baptism in this context is saying that these disciples are going to be baptized into the possession of the Godhead. You belong to God now. You are God's people. You've passed through the water. You belong to God. You belong to Jesus. You belong to the Spirit. You are not your own. You have been purchased. You've been bought with a price. And that's the purpose of baptism in, in Matthew's Gospel, to become the possession of God to become the possession of the Godhead. And so God's plan for spreading the kingdom throughout the whole world, as this is great plan, I mean, this is his wonderful plan, is for his people who have committed themselves to the work of Jesus to go into the world and make disciples for Jesus. And to continue that pattern. It's been happening for how many years now? Over 2,000 years on and on as people are going and preaching the gospel teaching the truth of Jesus, and people are, are leaving everything behind, and they're following after Him, making disciples for Jesus. Sorry, let me skip past that one. All right, so that was just the introduction. Um, Matthew chapter 4, this is our main text. Matthew chapter 4, this is our main text, verse 18. I promise I won't take that long. <clears throat> this is an interesting topic, because we've been talking through the Gospel of Matthew, we've been looking at the different contexts. This is chapter 4. Jesus has come out of temptation. He has begun his mission, uh, preaching that the kingdom of God was what? The kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. It's close by. And so the idea is that Jesus' purpose and mission is to bring about the rule and reign of God in the world. And then in verse 18 of chapter 4, it says, Now Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and they were casting nets into sea. And this, look what Matthew says. He says, for they were fishermen. I mean, what do you expect fishermen to be doing? You know, I mean, by the sea, casting nets, right? I mean, catching fish. I mean, this is what he's, the point is that this is everyday life, isn't it? There's nothing unusual about this. This is, this is day by day, every day, morning in, evening. This is what they do. They're fishermen, right? This is their livelihood. And then in verse 19, it says, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, that phrase, follow me, it simply means come after me, right? Just, just come after me to, 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 to leave everything and to go, 
to follow Jesus. And instead of being catchers of fish, Jesus says you'll become catchers of people, that people will be your new target, if you will. I don't know if that's not a very good word to use, but you know, you know the idea. The idea is instead of fish, they're going to be catching people. They're going to be going out and making disciples for Jesus. And look what it says in verse 20. This is great. Just think about this for a minute. Think about you. Think about your life. Think about what you're doing right now. Think about what they were doing. What if you were in their place and you're over there doing what you do day in and day out, making your living and you're fishing. Jesus calls you to follow him and immediately they left their nets and they followed him. What's Matthew trying to say here? When Jesus calls, lay down your nets and follow him. I mean, it's really that simple, isn't it? We know that there's more to the story, right? Because that's what we talked about before at the beginning of this lesson. The idea that the Gospels present a little bit of a different perspective each time. Matthew's perspective is very simple. This is what he wants us to see. He doesn't want to talk about all the other stuff. We'll cover that in other, other books, other Gospels. What Matthew wants us to see is that when Jesus comes and he calls these people from their everyday mundane life, whatever they were doing, what do they do? They immediately get up and they follow Jesus, right? They lay their nets beside them and they get up and they follow Jesus. Look at verse 21. It says, going on from there, he saw two brothers, James and the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, his father, and they're mending nets. I mean, so fishermen do, right? They mend nets. They cast nets. The nets get torn. They mend nets. They, day in, day out. This is what fishermen do. They mend their nets. And he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Same calling and same response. They left their nets behind, and they followed Jesus. And the nets become symbolic, don't they? They become symbolic of what Matthew is trying to, to push on us. This idea that radical discipleship requires leaving something behind. That if we want to follow Jesus, then we have to let some stuff go. That if we want to be the people that God is calling us to be, on the work that God is calling us to do, that we have to leave things behind and follow Him. So here, here's the question. What changed? Remember? What changed in your life when you decided to follow Jesus? What changed? I hope you've been thinking about that as we've been going through this lesson. What changed? What were your nets? What were your symbolic nets? What things did you lay behind and lay aside in order to get up and to follow? Maybe it was a career change. Maybe that was your reality. Maybe it was. Maybe it was a friendship. Maybe it were old habits. Right? I think maybe that fits all of us, old habits. Maybe we were, we were so privileged and we're so grateful for God that we were able to, to keep our old career and still follow Jesus. Maybe we're able to, to maintain friendships and relationships and still follow Jesus. Maybe that's who we were. Or maybe not. But altogether, we had to change some habits, didn't we? We had to make some changes in our life because that's what Jesus is calling us to do. Whatever your nets were, whatever they were, one thing is for sure, because of Jesus, because of the gospel, you cannot, you cannot live the way you once lived. Isn't that true? When you became a true disciple of Jesus, and you truly embraced his reality, who he is, that he's God in the flesh, that he's Emmanuel, God with us, that He's the Son of God. When you came to realize that and understand that, that He's the Savior, there's no way coming to that knowledge that your life could ever be the same, can it? It's not possible. It's not possible to come to know Jesus and just keep living the way we always lived. It's not possible to come to know Jesus and keep thinking the way we always thought. It's not possible. Things change because of Him. And we have to be willing to let go of things and let our nets down in order to follow him. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler? It's always a fascinating story to me. See, Jesus is, is teaching, he's preaching, he's doing what he's doing. We have these five great speech sections in Matthew. And then we have this man that comes to Jesus in this chapter. And he says, teacher, what, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? 
Remember that? And Jesus says to him, if you wish to enter life, he says, keep the commandments. Now, of course, he's talking about the old law, right? The idea of the commandments. And in Matthew's gospel, keeping the commandments is not just following a set of rules, but it's a radically different lifestyle. We learn that from the Sermon of the Mount. It's not about just following rules. It's not about going through the motions. But it's about a radically different lifestyle when we truly embrace the law of God, following the wisdom and the ways of God. That's how the Jews needed to see that. And so Jesus is ultimately saying, what you need to do is you need to change your life. And, and the man says, well, I've done that, right? I'm good. I've done all of that. I've always kept the commandments. And maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. I don't know. But what Jesus sees in this man is there's something there that's not there, right? There's something there that's missing, that he's still holding on to something, that in order to follow him, he's got to let something go. And Jesus sees that in this man. Look what he says. He says, if you wish to be complete, right? He says, if you want to be complete, go and sell everything. Go and sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. What was his net? What was keeping him from following Jesus? What was the day by day, the in in, day in and day out, the week in and week out that was keeping him from following Jesus? It was his possessions, right? It was all that he had. He loved that stuff. It was who he was. It identified him for who he was. And he, he's being called by Jesus to let that stuff go, to put that stuff aside. He said, go sell all that stuff. No, he's not... It's not a blanket statement as a prerequisite for salvation. You don't have to go sell all your stuff to be a Christian. That's not the idea. But if your stuff is keeping you from full commitment to the Lord, then guess what? You've got to make some changes, right? And so what is he saying to him? He's saying, go sell all of your possessions, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven and come follow me. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, guess what he did? Right? He didn't jump up and say, all right, let's go. Let's go do it. Whatever you want me to do, Jesus, I'll do. He didn't say that. He, he went away and he was, he was grieving for he was one who owned so much property. See, Jesus knew this man's heart, didn't he? He knew this man's heart. He knew what nets this man was carrying around with him. He knew what they looked like. And this young man, he was young, right? He had everything going for him. He was young. He was rich. He was powerful. He had, I'm sure he had people who looked up to him and trusted in him, and, and he had prestige in the community. I mean, you can imagine what this guy looked like. But that was his net. And Jesus says, you've got to lay that down. You've got to lay that net down. You've got to get up. You've got to follow me. And he wasn't willing to do that. He wasn't willing to commit to a true discipleship of Jesus. See, Jesus is not saying that disciples have to be jobless and broke. Don't hear that from this message. That's not the point of this message. That's not what he's saying. The point is there are things in life that will keep us on the boat. Isn't that the point? There are things in life that will keep us on the boat. There are things in life that will keep us in the sea and away from Jesus. There are just things, our nets. So what are your nets this morning? I want you to think about that. Maybe you've committed yourself to following Jesus. You've been baptized into the possession of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. But for some reason, you're, you're holding on to something. Something is just there. And whatever it is, it's just, it could be life. It could be just career. It could be relationship. It could be anything. But something is there that is really keeping you from fully committing yourself to the work. That's really committed, keeping you from full discipleship. Something's there. Something's there. So take a look at your hands. What's in it? What are you holding on to? And, it, and what you're holding on to right now, is it more important to you than your relationship with Jesus? That's the big question, isn't it? We need to ask ourselves that question every day. The thing that I'm holding on to that's keeping me from getting up and going, is that more important to me? Is it more valuable than a relationship with Jesus? Because if it's not, and I can tell you it's not, then it's time to let it go and get up and follow him. Leave your nets behind and get up and follow Jesus. It's worth it. It's worth it. If there's anybody here this morning who needs to put on Jesus, 
baptism, become the possession of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit through passing through the water. If there's anybody here this morning who needs the prayers of the congregation for encouragement and strength, please come forward as we stand and ask.